Cartilage grafts, ear versus rib versus septum. Why do we use them? What are their relative advantages and disadvantages? And what exactly am I about to do with this cutting board full of props and produce? I'm about to tell you in this video. So first, why we use cartilage grafts at all really boils down to two general reasons. The first reason is to improve anatomy that is creating a shape you don't like. I have two very good examples of this. So if the nasal tip is droopy and droops further when you smile, that is generally because the tip itself in the middle post is a little bit weak. And the best way to, best way to fix that is to strengthen that tip and hold it into the right position. How do we do that? Adding structure, adding support with cartilage grafts. Another really common place that we need to add structure or add support to a nose that is already weak in one place is on the side of the nose. So if the side of the nose is falling inward, that depression we often treat by supporting it out with cartilage grafts. So improving an existing shape that you don't like, that's a great reason for cartilage grafts. Also the plunging with smiling. Supporting that nose adequately prevents that plunge. The second reason we use cartilage grafts in rhinoplasty is to prevent the effects of surgery from causing problems later. And so I have another good indication for that personally. If you take a big bump off of a narrow nose like mine, when you take that bump off, the nose wants to become narrower down low and that can obstruct your breathing. And so when we use cartilage grafts as spreader grafts to help hold the walls of the nose up and out, it doesn't guarantee you won't have breathing problems, but it decreases those odds. Obviously that comes at a cost. The more I spread the nose out, the wider it seems on front view. So I'm always walking a fine line of trying to keep the nose delicate and also keep it structurally supported. Patients will often ask me, because they've read online or they've heard from a friend that, got, that grafts cause problems, do I absolutely have to use cartilage grafts in their case? And the answer is sometimes yes. There are things that grafts can do, supporting the tip, adding width, supporting a sidewall, preventing long-term collapse, that if I have hands tied and I'm not allowed to do that during the surgery, I would actually decline to do that surgery. So now let's talk about where we get these grafts. So my favorite place to get the grafts is the nasal septum. So I want you to imagine this as the divider between the two sides of my nose. And it has skin on either side, we call that mucosa, but then the actual cartilage is where we get our grafting material from. As you can see, this cartilage is deviated. So this wall bows in to the right nasal cavity and it would obstruct the breathing on the right side. So when we do a rhinoplasty, I very commonly also do a septoplasty. And what a septoplasty is, is we will leave a certain amount of cartilage intact, enough to support the bridge of the nose and enough to support the tip of the nose, and then take and harvest this extra piece. So we'll lift the skin up on either side and then harvest the septal cartilage right here. And this is all done through the nostrils and right here. And what we've left in place on the nose is enough of a strut to support the tip of the nose or the super tip to support the bridge of the nose. But we've harvested and borrowed that little window of cartilage. And in doing so, we've actually improved the deviation. We've cut that crooked portion out, leaving behind a more straight septum. We often have to do other things to the bottom part here, the caudal septum but most of the deviation poking into the airway has been removed. Now then, I have this cartilage harvest. And if you've ever seen me with cartilage harvest, I get very excited if I have a big piece and it's relatively straight. But this is what I can then use to create grafting material. Say I'll get rid of that crooked part. I'll maybe use this straight part and I will create grafting material to support the tip of the nose, to support the nasal sidewall. And so this is an analogy to septal cartilage. It's very thin, it's very strong, but there is a relatively small amount of it. If I'm coming back into a revision rhinoplasty, most of the time, this is what the septum already looks like on the inside. It's not a hole from the two sides because the skin, the mucosa is still there, but there's no more cartilage to safely harvest. I can't take any more of this away because we need this part to be structural. So then what? Where do I go if I don't have enough septal cartilage to harvest in a revision rhinoplasty 
or in a primary rhinoplasty. Some people's noses just, they have very little of this cartilage or all of it's actually bone and there's not enough to take and use. The next places we go are the ear and the rib. So here's where the produce comes in. Ear cartilage is very similar to this piece of cabbage. So when you look at ear cartilage inside between the skin layers, it is very similar to this. It's got an innate curve to it and it has ribs inside of it that create some of these shapes. So if I harvest a piece of rib cartilage, pardon me, ear cartilage from your ear, first off, we are leaving all the pieces of the ear that create shape intact. I'm taking the, the actual ear cartilage from down along the floor of the ear where it doesn't create shape. Also, just like the septum, I'm leaving the skin on the front, leaving the skin in the back so you really don't see any change. And what I'm left with is cartilage harvested from the ear. Similar to this cabbage, this cartilage is always curved and it always has little ribs on it. So if I'm trying to use it for structure, I often have to take cartilage like this and try to shave off the high spots, maybe cut it into pieces and wedges and hope that I can get a nice straight flat piece that is relatively straight big enough. Some parts are too floppy to use. Some parts are a little stronger, but they're still not perfectly straight. Sometimes we'll score cartilage to get it to open up a little bit. When we do that, we can get it to straighten a little further, but things just like that happen. Ear cartilage is very brittle. And so it's good in that patients have a fair amount of it. You have two ears to give but it's not good in that it's curved, it's often very floppy. The places I like to use ear cartilage are where its strength is not super, super important. So I can use it to support a sidewall. Sometimes I'll use it to support the delicate curves of the nostril. It's actually perfect for that right off the bat. But if I need real structural support, real strength, ear is not my favorite. Rib is my favorite cartilage for real structural support. So when I have rib cartilage, we can either take that from the patient themselves, or we can take the rib cartilage from a donor. We use donor cadaveric rib quite a lot. Um, it is very similar to this. It's round, it's not a nice flat piece, and it's got different characteristics. It's got kind of a rind on the outside and a kind of uh, forgiving piece on the inside. So with rib cartilage, we are doing something exactly like this. We're taking the rind off of the outside and we're making kind of slices out of this rib cartilage. And you can see if we get rid of these rind sections and leave behind the heart of the broccoli stem or the heart of the rib, this starts to become a material that is straighter Again, kind of like good septum. There's more rind here than I thought. The reason I like these Chinese cleavers, by the way, is they serve as board scrapers too. So we have good cartilage in the middle here. This part's relatively straight. And then we can make our grafts out of this. Now, one thing we got to watch out for with rib is if we leave this external portion on the cortex of the rib on, it is much more prone to warping. So this piece doesn't really want to warp one way or the other. It is pretty strong. Even if I cut it into thinner pieces, it's not going to want to warp really dimensionally one way more than the other. This piece is very different. It's got the external part on there, so it will warp very readily one direction, but it won't warp much the other direction because the external part is stopping that. As a matter of fact, over time, with no pressure on it at all, this will want to bend like that. So one of the issues with rib cartilage is we have to watch out. We have to watch out for warping. And we have to make sure we get all that cortex off of there to keep it from wanting to warp towards the cortex side. Now, as far as your own cartilage versus donor cartilage, you can start a fight among surgeons as to which is better. There are several papers that show that donor cartilage, if it is frozen and washed, uh, washed with um, detergents to get rid of any potential contamination, 
or low dose of radiation, it should live just as long as your own cartilage. But there is some feeling, I mean, I can see it, where your own cartilage would be better. The downside of your own cartilage is you have a donor site on the male chest or under a breast, and we have some risk to the lungs, to the chest cavity. Um, there's obviously a scar and pain involved. In my office, since I do absolutely everything under sedation and local anesthesia instead of general anesthesia, I use exclusively donor cartilage. And so far I've had excellent luck with it. And I trust the papers that have shown that donor cartilage that's either detergent washed or low dose radiation treated um, has a lifespan and has an acceptance rate just as high as your own rib cartilage from your chest. So the last thing we will use cartilage grafting for is camouflage. So sometimes we need to fill just a little dent right up here at the radix. You'll see people do this with injections, with injection rhinoplasty, or maybe a little bit extra on the tip, or maybe a little depression. After we've done all the structure work, sometimes we need to do camouflage. And for camouflage, we're making paste out of whatever cartilage we have left over. And we can do it by cutting it into little pieces. We can also do it by smashing it. And as you can imagine, it almost doesn't matter if it's rib cartilage or ear cartilage or septal cartilage, they all kind of turn into paste just as well as each other. So for that, we kind of use just whatever's left over. So I hope that helps you understand, number one, why we need grafts. It's usually to improve an existing suboptimal shape like a droopy tip or a collapsed sidewall. Sometimes to build up a soft bridge on a flatter nose patient like an ethnic nose. Um, it's often to prevent problems, adding structure so that the contraction of the healing process doesn't ruin the rhinoplasty. It doesn't guarantee that there are no problems, but it certainly helps minimize that. It's often for camouflage grafting at the end of surgery. The places we get it, septum is preferred. It's thinnest, strongest, it's your own, and it's right there in the surgical field. Ear is pretty good, but it's only as good as the ear itself. Some people's ears are little, some people's ears are intensely curved. Rib is excellent, um, either donor or from your own. Lots of pluses and minuses either way. If you have any questions at all, please DM me, put them in the comments below. If you found this video educational and helpful, please share it with a friend. Thank you so much.